Hi, I'm Martine Bernard. And I'm Monty Haas. And this is Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books. Hey, Martine. What are you up to? I thought you were going to write a story. Well, I was. I mean, I am. Well, Monty, you know that art's a very important part of storytelling, whether it's illustrations in a children's book or animated films. Or even the pictures we draw in our minds when we're listening to stories. Right. You know, that reminds me of the theme for today's show, the art of storytelling. Well, I'm all set. I've got my paintbrush, my paint, my easel. But I don't know what to paint. <laughs> well, I spoke with Peter H. Reynolds, an author and illustrator and the founder of Fable Vision. And he likes to start his stories with pictures and then build them from there. In fact, one of his books, The Dot, deals with the whole idea of freeing yourself in order to create. Why don't we see what else Peter has to say about storytelling? This is one of my all-time favorite books in the entire world. You like this book? Look, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. It's a, it is, it's a blank book. Peter, I know you love blank books. Why is that? I love blank books because they are an invitation for you to create. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in school trying to encourage kids to write. But you get a sheet of paper with lines on it and I love lines, I, don't get me wrong, but um, the nice thing about a blank book is it's, it's bound, there are sheets of white paper, and if you want to write in lines, you can, but if you want to tell your picture in stories, you can do that, or you can combine the, the, the two. The parents gone out and bought the blank book, and then suddenly they reached the dot point. Where do I start? What do I do? <laughs> what do you recommend? If your kids are too young to do their own writing, it's perfectly all right for you to sit there and be the scribe. In fact, that's uh, some of the best stories when kids, it just kind of comes flowing out. Write it down. They tell it, you write it. Yeah, you write it, and they can, you can illustrate, they can illustrate, you can illustrate together. You can uh, cut things out of magazines and use those as illustrations. Uh, but making it a collaborative effort is, uh, it, it, it'll be one of those experiences you never forget. There's my paintbrush, and what I can do is I can Dip, dip into here like this, right? And then I can paint with my, paint with my right? Talk to me about developing that sense of story. My kind of storytelling, and there are so many kinds of storytelling out there, but my particular kind of storytelling, I like it simple. In fact, what I, I'll do is I'll st just take a stack of cards uh, note cards, and you can get them at a convenience store. Uh, three by five note cards, sometimes they have lines on. I just flip them over and there are no lines. And, um, and what I'll do is I'll just storyboard out the idea. And I think a really good story you can almost tell without words. And then what I'll do is afterwards I go back and I put captions underneath each picture. And it almost, it forces me to keep it as simple as possible. And, uh, and then later on I'll take those words and I'll, you know, type them up onto the computer. And, uh, but keeping it, keeping it simple, not, not confusing the message. How can parents do that? I think some of the best stories that parents tell are the stories of them growing up. And kids love to hear those stories. They, imagining your parents as six-year-olds or ten-year-olds um, I mean, all of us have had our own adventures, and it's not just one story. I mean, there were many stories growing up. So uh, think about, you know, is there a story that you can tell of the five-year-old version of you, the six-year-old, the seven? And, and think, you know, dig through photographs and see what they inspire. Peter, help parents out who feel that they've told the story, maybe sitting around a dinner table, but now where do they go with it? What can they do with it? One of my big... Uh, suggestions is to uh, to write it down to to actually create one at least one copy um, and uh, you know make it look pretty and you know uh, put a wrap it up and put a, a bow on it and give it as a gift what are some of the ways that parents can make storytelling interactive with their kids 
the most important part is for you to be interested in the story. So be excited about the story. And also don't be afraid to use voices. You know, uh, if it's a frog, you know, it could be any, uh, any voice. You can have fun with it. Uh, and also have your kids become characters. Um, and take some time out and if you want to role play the, role play the story. Vashti painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot. Do you want to actually, how about if we, let's see, where's the purple? Is that purple? Do you want to do it? Do you want to do a dot? Mm -hmm. A purple dot? It's beautiful. If it's a story about a little girl who goes to an art museum, uh, well, why not plan on it going to the art museum with your kids the day after? Or, you know, you can read to them uh, before you go into the museum, read that story, and then the museum takes on a whole new, a whole new meaning. And every single book has an opportunity for you to uh, riff on and, and m make it become real. Wow, Peter is really terrific with kids. I feel so inspired by him. And look at all the great artwork that the boys from the workshop are turning out. True, and what's extra great about it is that these boys are mixing stories and interests in art, expanding on ideas they've read about, or launching whole new stories of their own. That's amazing. And not only does Peter fire up the kids he works with, he also inspires their parents. I talked with Bill Doucette and Elizabeth Hetzler, a couple of parents who are following Peter's lead and taking stories in new directions. We're making a, a game dealing with Harry Potter in, the, in the, his first three books. And um, so we made, uh, I made a couple of characters. We got Harry Potter going on over here, Norbert the Norbert, dragon yes. coming out of his shell. I like Norbert. And Ian likes Norbert. He wants to be Norbert in the game when we play. Now with games, you often get into the storytelling aspect of things because that's something that yeah, so it's, not, it's not like just roll the dice, move a guy around or something like that. Um, with the, the Harry Potter game that we're making, we're going to be making these uh, cards that tell them what they have to do. Um, parts of the story pulled into it. Uh, if it is rolling the dice or having to move back three spaces, it has something to do with time changing, things like this that, that just make it a little bit more exciting. How do you foster storytelling in the family themselves, besides the games and the, and the reading? Are there um, I have like I have a knight puppet and a dragon puppet and a wizard puppet and and stories come out of that and and they just work so well. Um, any just anything that you have an interest in or had an interest in as a kid that you can bring back and and kind of show them how much you have. If you're having fun with something, the child is going to want to have fun with you with that something. We've just read to our children from day one, and then we talk about the stories and. We do things, we maybe cook things that are somehow related, or Ooh, fun. we Tell talk me how about, that works. well, if there's a story about, like Curious George with bananas, we'll make banana bread or something. And sure. actually, I, the math side of me really enjoys doing cooking with my kids too, because th that's a whole other type of language and Absolutely. story that's told. And we do, they love to do that. Tell us how you weave cooking and books and, and imagination all together with your family. Um, when my daughter was little, we got a book called Pretend Soup, which is done by the person who did the Moosewood cookbooks, oh, Molly yes. Katzen. Right. And it's for, she had written it for her preschool and, well, compiled it. Right. And there's, you do not have to be a reader to do it. It, it sort of tells a story when you're following the pictures because you start with these ingredients and you, you know, it's a storytelling type of thing. True. Um, and then as they became readers, we would do more with reading the recipes. One thing that we did the other day was we made something called the Enchanted Broccoli Forest, which is a recipe that you use broccoli spears in, and they are trees, they are the forest. You stick them into <laughs> the casserole and then you bake it. And William and I made it together, and he loved it. So I see it as a multifaceted learning situation. I don't tell them that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, you know it has a lot of the math. I think as they get older and they have to learn about fractions, which is a very hard concept. True. This is a really nice way to make it less painful. 
Um, there's the reading that's involved, the following of directions, which I think is a really important tool. And what I'm doing by talking about it this way is making it sound like it's this very dry educational thing, but it's actually really fun. And I, and we don't really talk about, okay, now you're going to be learning direction right. following, and now you're going, no, we, we really make it just a fun thing. And then at the end, you get to eat it. Hey, Martine, this is quite a collection of dots you've got here. Thanks, Monty. It's really helping me to get this creative juices flowing so I can write an original story based on my art. Ah, you mean like Honey and Laura Joy do. Exactly. I need to connect the dots if you know what I mean. Sure I do. You just go like this. <laughs> no, I don't mean it in that way. I mean I need to put things together to move my story along. But wait a minute. What? I've got it. My story will be about the first star to shine in the evening sky. Thanks for the help, Monty. No problem, Martine. Say, you do realize that you've got a star for the star of your story. Oh, Monty. <laughs> I see Honey has found her favorite Honey as Artist photograph and some of her drawings for her storytelling time. Art is something Honey really likes to do in her free time. Honey has lots of stories to tell about the things she likes and sometimes she tells me her stories by drawing pictures. We like to talk about what she draws and write down her words as we go. Today she's drawing flowers and we've been talking about how they grow in the spring. I can always ask questions to keep a story going or she can ask me some. Do you like blue flowers, honey? Do you like them short or tall? Tall ones. Children often will fill in details when you show interest and getting them to tell part of the story helps them develop a sense of story for themselves. How do you think we could draw this so it looks like the flowers are growing? A long stem? Okay. Feeding the fish, Martine? How is the catfish today? You mean le poisson chat. Martine, you know I can't speak French. Come on, Monty, just try the pronunciation. Le poisson chat. Le poisson chat. And the seahorse is le hippocamp. Le hippocamp. See, you can do it. Now try the dogfish. Le chien de mer. Le chien de mer. Very good. It's so much fun to speak in French, my first language. Our next guest, Luis Gonzalez, loves telling stories in his first language, Spanish. He has some great ideas for building stories with kids, too. What's that? That is the clownfish. <laughs> One of the first stories we ever told, uh, the ones I told to Ariana, it was about, um, it was a peanut. It was a peanut in Spanish, it's a cacahuate. Mm -hmm. And so he made up this funny little story about a peanut whose name he couldn't say. He was so tiny that he couldn't say his name and he said it as Tatahuate. <laughs> and so we had, we had a great time with that. And she comes back to the story every, every time we do stories. How do you begin? Right before she goes to sleep, we're very comfortable. And so when she doesn't have a book that she's prepared for, to read that night, you know, she'll, she'll just say, oh, let's, let's do a story. And that, that's how we start. And when she starts to think that she could introduce the idea of having a story told to her, she lights up. Now Gil has a scar on his side and his fin, right? So do, do you know how he got that scar? Uh -huh. No. Well, he was a little boy when Gil was a little fish, and he used to be, he used to be very scared of everything. He didn't want to go anywhere without his mom and his daddy, or he wanted to be close to his friends. Where do your characters come from? We picked them out of movies a lot of times. Like they, they like the Finding Nemo characters because they, they know them from the movie that they've seen over again. But uh, a lot of times we just pull them from, from, our, from out of the hat. You know, we talk about a flower or we do about an ant. Uh, we've done stories about caterpillars. And so we, we, we get creative with, with the subject. But a lot of times they, they go back to, to the movie characters because they, they know them so well. Who likes bubbles on Finding Nemo? Bubbles. 
Why do they call him Bubbles? Because he, he likes bubbles. <laughs> because he loves bubbles. Huh? Mm. Look at that. Oh, look at. I think he loves bubbles too. I try to incorporate um, a, a lesson into stories. You know, some some value that I like for them to pick up. And so, you know, we did a story in this case. We did a story of Gil and how he became brave. You know, and so we talk about not being afraid and and being brave. Or if we do a story about a flower who's growing up. You know, a flower who may be shy and who doesn't want to be out there and in full bloom. And so we talk about shyness. So I, I try and do that. What are some of the tips that you could offer to parents who don't have that much time or who don't feel as creative about creating stories? You don't have to be ultra creative. Um, the, very first story I, the very first story I ever told to them was about an ant. You know, we just, we, we pulled something out of a hat and we just kind of, made up little things about it, oh, you know, what's his name, or where did he live, or, you know, what did he like, or, you know, how, you know, what challenges is he going through. So we, the, the kids can help with that a lot, and they're very creative, and so they're much more creative than I can be. And so where I falter, and they, they have tons of ideas. So they pick up where, yeah. where yeah. you left off. Or, or they, they lead me. <laughs> They'll say, John, clean me. No, he's like, no, go just says, go take a bath. And then he goes, I don't want to take a bath. <laughs> He'll start crying, no, no, my mommy made me take a bath every day and I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Yeah. That's sweet. Yes. So we've seen illustration, games, cooking, conversations about art, even movies. So many different ways for connecting with stories. You're right, Martine. And all of these different ideas support keeping parents and kids involved in the art of storytelling. Who knew that there could be so many ways to originate, tell, and extend stories? Our guests certainly knew, and I'm so glad that they've shared that with us. Me too, but we're not done yet. Right. Bonnie Greenberg, a professional storyteller, has her own way of keeping families involved. Wow! And Sunny Boy and Grandma came running up the stairs and said, Sunny Boy, you're driving me crazy. Oh, I know, I know. I'm going to get the piggy and put the piggy in bed with you. Then will you be afraid when I close the squeaky door? Sonny Boy said, no, not me. Bonnie, what got you started on storytelling? Well, Monty, you know I'm a speech-language pathologist, yes. and I've been doing that for a number of years. But storytelling started way before that. When I was a little girl, my grandfather answered every question I had with a story. And he would say to me, <laughs> Bonilla, do you understand? And I would say, yes, Sadie. He'd say, then tell it to me back. So I've <laughs> had him as my very first coach, and I've been telling stories since I was about five years old. Bonnie, one of the things I loved that you did with the children and the parents in the story itself was the repetition that allowed them to really bring it home, that allowed them to participate. Talk to us about repetition and its importance in storytelling. Well, especially with a group this age, if you tell a story like The Squeaky Door, all you have to do is say a couple of those chants one or two times and the children spontaneously join in. I love to watch their faces when they're going, not me. <laughs> the parents were laughing too. It was so much fun to bring them all in. Sonny boy, you're driving me crazy. Oh, I know, I know. I'm going to get the doggy and put the doggy in bed with you. Then will you be afraid when I close the squeaky door? Sonny boy said no. Not me. Repeating that part of the story, having gestures that go along with it naturally, that's the thing that gives them like a whole body experience and they take that home. That helps them remember it. Stories are a mnemonic. They are a way of remembering information. So when I do storytelling, the magic of storytelling in the classroom, and I tell people once you get all your information, in story form, the students have a much better chance of remembering that information. I wish I could have some stars in my branches, too. And she sent her wish right up to heaven, and a voice came out of the heavens and said, Patience, little apple tree. <laughs> Jay O'Callaghan is my mentor, and he taught me that 
really storytelling is theater of the face and you're using your face in so many ways the expressions on your face the voice that comes out of your body you can vary the pace you can vary the volume I did a lot of that today as a matter of fact so that the children could also try saying things very loudly or very softly and they could sing along and do motions or they could do the motions without singing. That was beautiful. And they remembered the sequence. Yes, they did. And we only sang it three times, but they got the sequence. And that's a very important thing for learning to read and learning to comprehend what you're being told in school. May there always be sunshine. May there always be blue skies. May there always be mama. May there always be me. What do you suggest to parents when one child in the family seems to excel at storytelling and the other child maybe stands in the shadow? I think that would be a time to do group storytelling. One of my favorite storytelling games for home is to have the parents sit around with the children and tell a story that they're making up. Or it could be one they all know, like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. One person starts it, that's the beginning or the kickoff. The next person tells the middle, and the third person brings it to an end. Now you can play that same game again, but this time, this person tells the beginning. Then this person tells the middle. And after a while, children lose their self-consciousness because they're focusing on what part of the story they're telling. I see you've brought a book to share. I did. This is called Bringing the Story Home, The Complete Guide to Storytelling for Parents. And it was written by a friend of mine, Lisa Lipkin, a New York storyteller. What does it give parents? Inside this book, you have some great bibliographies and resources, and in addition, some specific exercises, things you can do to make storytelling a very special time in your home. For example, one of the things you can do is create a ritual around storytelling so that it occurs in a special place, a special chair perhaps, or with a special afghan, the story quilt maybe. Nice. Another thing I do sometimes is light a candle and that starts the storytelling and at the end of the last story, I blow it out. Now let's review the highlights of today's show. Peter H. Reynolds suggests Consider starting stories with pictures. Write down the stories you tell. Have fun with stories. Use voices and role play. Like Bill Doucette, create games based on stories. Don't forget, having fun is contagious. Elizabeth Hetzler recommends read together and discuss stories from day one. Remember, fun activities can help children learn vital skills. Lori Joy suggests Discuss pictures and use children's words for captions. Ask questions to keep stories going. Like Luis Gonzalez, integrate your first language into storytelling. Let children build stories with you. Bonnie Greenberg recommends, try repeating phrases and gestures in stories. Provide opportunities for children to participate. Look for books with storytelling ideas and exercises. Now here's Miriam Marichak's recommended Words That Cook book list. Brought to you by the Cookie Bookie Bears. For Zero to Three, Do Your Ears Hang Low by Caroline Jane Church. And Give the Dog a Bone by Stephen Kellogg. For Three to Six, I Know a Shy Fellow Who Swallowed a Cello by Barbara S. Gariel. And Tell Me One Thing, Dad, by Tom Powell. For six to nine, Into the Forest, by Anthony Brown. The Story Tree, Tales to Read Aloud, as retold by Hugh Lupton. And You Read to Me, I'll Read to You, Very Short Fairy Tales to Read Together, by Mary Ann Hoberman. And for 9 to 12, All the World's a Stage by Rebecca Pyatt Davidson. 
America, My New Home, poems by Monica Gunning, and William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, as retold by Bruce Coville. For a complete list of books, links, and other great ideas that will help make reading more fun for you and your kids, go to our website, wordsthatcook.org. Now you've got some new ideas to play with, so go and have some fun with Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books in, in your, your kitchen. kitchen.